son and the substance of Christianity is on the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us prepare to hear God's truth through the preaching of the word which begins with prayer. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God, now as we have heard your word, fill us with your spirit, soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth through the preaching of the word. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Have you ever heard that quote? I don't believe in God, but I miss him. There's a quote written by a 76-year-old author who's written many books throughout his lifetime. His name is Julian Patrick Barnes. Julian Patrick Barnes. He, he He's written many novels, and he's won awards for his novels. He's written about, or the, especially the novels that he's won awards on, they're about death, if you can imagine that. Death or suicide. Certainly life at the bitter end, life at its bitter end. What's interesting about Julian Patrick Barnes is that he's an atheist. He is an atheist. He does not believe in, 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 in God, in God in, in any form. He does not believe in God. Barnes refer, refers to Christianity as, uh, as, a, as a story that has ended, a story that's, that's over, that's ended. And then he talks about his life, and he talks about when the story of Christianity ended in his life. He said, years ago, Christianity ended in, in, in his family, his extended family, when his grandmother lost her, uh, her faith, her Methodist faith. She was, she was a part of a, the Methodist de denomination. She lost her faith. She lost her Methodist faith and started worshiping politics. She started worshiping politics and political parties. Does that sound familiar today? She started worshiping politics. She, eventually, she became a communist or a socialist. Boy, that sounds very familiar. Barnes goes on to say that there hasn't been anything like faith in his family for years, for years. That's why he talks about that, especially no church attendance, absolutely not. And he talks about, that's why I don't believe in God, but I miss him, but I miss him. So at one time, they did attend church, and, it did, and at one time, as he was growing up, he was a, well, he went to a Christian church, or somewhat of a Christian church. Barn says, I don't believe in God, but he has this sense of emptiness, this sense of longing for something, longing to find something. And, 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 and even in his own words, he doesn't understand what he's saying. And he's saying, but I miss him. But I miss him. But, but he's a self-proclaimed atheist. But he doesn't believe in God. What's he saying here? What he desires to have and what he's missing. <laughs> this, what he's missing, it, we know what he's missing. He's missing Christ. He has this sense of emptiness, this sense of loneliness. He has this sense of no hope. There is no hope in his life. None. Well, the only grat gratifying thing that could happen goes on today. What happened today? What goes on today? What may happen tomorrow at best. 
in his sense of longing, he writes something very interesting. Uh, he, he wrote something very interesting, and I'll, write, and I'll read it to you. He says, in life, if, he says, if life is a mere prelude or preparation for something else, now here he's talking about heaven, something bigger. So he says, if life is a mere prelude or preparation for something else, then life becomes both trivial and more important. Well, so for somebody that's an atheist, he sure is preaching, preaching to us. Because we that's good. That's good stuff for a, for a Christian. Now, what, he's, what he's basically saying is that if, there, if Christianity is true, then life is trivial, certainly compared to heaven and the kingdom that's coming. And it is a prepper, and it's certainly more important. Life is more important than you can than you can imagine, especially when it comes to receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's not what he's saying, but that's what he's writing, and that's what we hear in our ears as Christians. It's unfortunate in his loneliness that he has no hope, except for the here and now. Now listen, I do not want to compare Barnes with this madman who entered the elementary school in, in, in uh, um, Uvalde, 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 last week. Other than to say that both those men have no hope. There is no hope. There, there was no hope. And, and that describes our fractured world. That is why our fractured that's why we live in a fraction. This that's a definition of, of how we live in this fallen, fractured world, full of emptiness, full of no hope, except what you can get out of it. That's why people start worshiping, and we've talked about this before. That's why people start worshiping politics, because that's the best it's going to get. And if your political party doesn't get elected, then you're out of luck till the next time for till the next election. This is a fractured, broken world where evil reigns. The Uvalde murderer had no hope. He had no hope in living or dying. No hope. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, as we mournfully endure the heart-searing grief of this tragedy, of this horrific tragedy, we're all feeling a great sense of loss, a great sense of emptiness. As our society, as our society's most vulnerable, most defenseless, fell victim to a wicked, cowardly madman, an, an attacker. Uh, we, we, we just can't comprehend this. We can't comprehend how bad it is and how, and how to handle something like this. That assailant will now stand in judgment before a perfectly righteous judge where he will meet his ultimate demise. You see, we all have to answer to him. Whether you believe in him or not, it, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. It, it does. But if you say you're an atheist and don't believe in God, that's okay. God's not going to twist your arm and force you to believe. But you'll stand before him at the final judgment. Still, the question is asked, why? Why? How can babies be slaughtered like, like worthless carnage? How can that happen? Regrettably, this is not the first time this has occurred. There have been 210 mass shootings in the U.S. this year, and many of them involve children. So it's not the first time. And unfortunately, it won't be the last time. That's madness. That's madness. But this is not heaven. And it's not hell either. 
This is the hopelessness of a fractured world, a broken world that God has put us in, that God has his people in to share something wonderful, something glorious, and that is the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our future resurrection. We are at war with demonic forces in the heavenly realm who whisper in our ears and cause madmen to go even more insane. The world is searching, searching. The fractured world is searching for answers. Answers that they want to hear. They're searching for hope. Hope that they can believe in. And they tell a Christian, they look at you being a Christian and say, where is your God? Where is your God? Oh, you know what, Manny? That's why I don't believe in God. Because of you, Valdi. They don't understand that. They got it completely backwards. That's why you should believe in God. Because this is broke. This is a broken world. A fractured world. So if people look at you as Christians and say, where is your God? Well, your response to that is the resurrection. Is the resurrection, is the resurrection of Christ. In the resurrection, Jesus Christ conquered sin and death. This message of eternal hope is the reason for the for God's for our existence. It's the reason for the church's existence. So we can spread this good news, this reason. So we can so we can share some with, with others who are looking, searching. We can share Christ with them. We can share the gospel with them. That's our task as, as a church. That's your task as a true believer, is to share Christ. So we continue our sermon series in the, in the book this, the, of, of 1 Corinthians. This morning, the critical issue that the great apostle Paul is, is addressing with the Corinthian church is the denial of the resurrection of the dead. That was an issue with the Corinthians there. It's the denial of the resurrection of the dead. As we look at our passage, that's what, that's what Paul's talking about. That's what he's addressing. Now we do notice that in chapter 15 here, there's an abrupt change from what he's talked about before in, this, in the past chapters, and even in the chapter right before. Uh, this chapter functions as a crescendo uh, a, a climax, a climax to the entire letter of 1 Corinthians is recognized. This letter is recognized, or this chapter is recognized as the, as the high watermark of Paul's, Paul's theological exposition. The resurrection, the resurrection. Paul moves from talking about orderly sacred worship and then reminding them of who and what it's all about. Reminding them of who and what it's all about. The resurrection of our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the hope. Our only hope for eternal life. And it's God's promise to us, his people, that this hope will not disappoint this hope is a God promise. It would not disappoint. It cannot disappoint us. Our text starts off first by addressing Christianity's stand on the resurrection. And then it goes, to talk, uh, goes on to talk about how Christians anchor their faith in the testimony of eyewitnesses to the resurrection. the testimony of eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Now we start off by looking at Christianity, how Christianity stands, Christianity, your faith, stands on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When, when we sustain a, a horrible tragedy, an appalling loss in our life, 
we're reminded, as we're, we as Christians are reminded of the gospel message, uh, our, of our hope in the gospel message, that Christ is who he is, and of his promises, his promises to us, we find comfort in that. Okay, you recall in the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, the, the nation had suffered a tremendous, a horrendous, a horrendous loss of their king, their earthly king, Uzziah. Uzziah, Uzziah was beloved by, by uh, Isaiah and, and the people. He was beloved by them. So when he died, the whole nation grieved. They felt this emptiness and this sorrow. This sense of hopelessness fell upon them. So what does the Almighty God do? What does our, what does our Almighty, God, Almighty God do for this? Well, he sends a grieving nation a reminder. God calls up Isaiah. He calls him up to the highest heaven. And there Isaiah sees the Lord, the Lord high and lifted up, still seated on his mighty throne. The Lord is still in control. He is still reigning over all his creation. That's the message that he sends Isaiah and through Isaiah to the nation. That's the message we have to remember today that the Lord still reigns, that he's still seated high and is still in control of all his creation. This is a reminder for God's people that, that he still reigns, this, that there is something bigger, something much, much bigger than us. And that's what the Apostle Paul is, is that's the message he's conveying to the Corinthian church. That's the message that God's word today is conveying to us today. It is a reminder that in the midst of a tragedy, in the midst of a tragedy, and you will go through it, and you're going through it now, but you will go through others in the midst of that, when you're feeling that, that he is still high lifted up, that he is still in, in, in control, that God's still in control, even in this fractured world, even in this fallen world. Listen, listen to what Paul says. He says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel. The gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are saved. Wow, that's some, that's some awesome words just to put right down on a, on, on a whiteboard, so to keep around your house somewhere, just to remember what that is, what he just said to us. Now repeat it. He's reminding us today, reminding us today, after this Uvalde tragedy, he's reminding us. Brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preach to you, meaning what we got from the word that you received, you received it, in which you stand, by which you are being saved. This is the gospel message of eternal salvation that we, God's people, believe and stand on today. We received. We received it. Believed it. And that's how we're saved. We're saved by that. This, that's the, the foundation of the gospel message. Uh, it, it, is, it is essential for us to understand that for our salvation. The Corinthians did not hold fast to, to that. They did not believe the promises of God. So they rejected the resurrection. I mean, they rejected the foundation of the whole gospel. They rejected, how can you reject a foundation? But what, what do you think the, the gospel is? Then what is Christianity if you reject the resurrection? What is Christianity if you reject the resurrection? Well, it's just a good, just a good philosophy. It's a good philosophy to live by. Yeah, oh God, Jesus, he was a great philosopher. I like that. 
that's that's pointless and meaningless. And Paul says that we're to be pitied if we believe that, if we if we don't believe the resurrection. <coughs> Excuse me. And then Paul, and then so they rejected it. And and, and Paul it refers to that as their faith being deemed useless. Their faith is useless. If you don't believe in the resurrection, think about this. Think you personally right now. Think about this. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, your faith is useless. Because you're no, you don't believe that you're going to be raised from the dead in the future when he returns. You, it's useless. It, it's just hard to comprehend why you would be wasting your time with Christianity if you don't believe it. And Paul says that unless you believed in vain. And the word vain in the Greek, the word vain, kino, the word vain has to do with being empty or without effect. The gospel has no effect on you. You hear the gospel. You've heard it. You've seen it with other people. You share the gospel. It's like, that sounds good, man. That's great that you believe that. And then we keep, they keep going on with their lives. It has no effect on them. That's what, it's what when Paul says, unless you believed it in vain, that's what he means. No effect. It has no effect on you. Nothing. Nothing's there. The Corinthians, for the Corinthians, the promise, God's promise, was empty. They did not believe in the resurrection, even though there were eyewitnesses to it. Still alive. They were still alive during that time. They were still alive during that time, including Paul. So that brings us to the second, to our second point. Uh, Christian, Christians anchor, you anchor your faith to the testimony of eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Because so, when you talk about the resurrection, so many people say, how do you know it happened? How do you know it's real? How do you know? It was, it, it just tells us there was so many witnesses to it. What are they going to say? Oh, that's really not true. They, they have no standing there. They have no standing there. They're not going to undo what 500 plus people have already said. They have no standing. After, the, after an event like what took place in, in, in Uvalde, we are starting to see eyewitnesses here, eyewitnesses come out and, and talk about what occurred, what they saw, uh, even though this was a, a traumatic event, they're starting to talk about what they saw, what, what they witnessed. And, and when you talk to them, it's like they give you verbatim exactly what they saw, verbatim what they witnessed. And what they witnessed will affect them the rest of their lives. Well, you can imagine those who saw the resurrected Christ they saw something incredible, something tremendous. Because first they saw him die, dead. Then they saw him alive again. Changed their life. Traumatic, dramatic experience. Changed their life. You can imagine that everyone, okay, just remember, but you have these people, including the disciples, who saw Jesus killed, die on the cross. And then he's resurrected. And, and these people are witnesses. They spoke with, touched him, ate with him. They ate, touched, spoke with the resurrected Christ. And they saw him in his physical resurrected body. That is traumatic. That, that is tremendous. It's more than shocking to them that he would be alive. It changed their life. That's why the, the disciples were, were willing, willing to die for, to spread the gospel. So Paul goes on in, in verses 3 and 4, retelling the gospel message. In, in verses 3 or 4, Paul retells the Corinthians the gospel, but he sums it up. It, it's, in a, it's, it's a brief, concise summary of the gospel. The apostle begins by, by first saying, I deliver to you, I deliver to you what I first received. Okay, what does that mean? I deliver to you what I first received. That means he's not making it up. It, the gospel is the gospel. So it happened. And it spread. And it was shared with Paul. He received it. 
as truth. He shared it with them and us as truth. That's why he starts off like that. He's not making it up. Paul's not making this up. Paul received the message from someone and delivered it to somebody else. And that's what we're called to do. Before we keep going, I want you to know that that's what you're called to do. You received it. Now you're called to share it. That's hard, isn't it? You know why it's so hard? Because you're trying to do it with a loved one. And they know you. They know how flawed you are. How messed up you are. And then you're telling them all this good stuff, this just good news. And they're like, who do you think you are? Right? You, they're the they're not buying it because it's you telling them, and you're telling them because you love them. You you love them to death, and you're willing to look like a fool in their eyes by sharing this message. So either you're going to do it or you're not, but you're called to. No, you're commanded to to share it. And it starts with your loved ones, and it goes from there. Sometimes I think it's easier to spread it with somebody you don't even know. That, that's willing to listen. But if you care about your loved ones, you're going to share it with them. And they're going to go, how can you tell me all this, you sinner? And then you go, well, I got you. you know, you're calling me a sinner. That means you believe something. And you go, well, that's why I believe it, because I am a sinner. But th that's, that's the message we're called to deliver. Okay, so Paul keeps going. Paul continues, and he says this. He says, Christ died. He reminds them that Christ died for our sins. He, he died for their sins. He died for our sins. This is a substitute. Jesus is a substitute. He paid the penalty for the crime, for the sin that we committed against who? Against God himself, the judge, the supreme judge. And according to Scripture, he atones for our sins. What does he mean by atoning? He dies for our sins. He pays the penalty. He dies in our stead. He is our, what we would call, substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement. Now, when, when some people hear that, well, you may be hearing that. You're just going, like, this is a lot of stuff. I don't know if I can buy this or not. I, I mean, it, I want to buy it. I, I, I want to believe it. And it's certainly, golly, I want it to be real. You know what? It is real. This is God's promise. It's his promise to you. Now, if you believe anything in this world, I would pray that you would believe God making a promise to you. Because it will not be broken. It, it cannot be broken. So after he dies, after Christ dies, he is buried. And on the third day, he's, he's raised from the dead in accordance to Scripture, all foreseen ahead of time. This means that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He rose from the dead, physically rose. He overcame death. Now in verses 5 through 9, Jesus appears in his resurrected body, to the disciples, first to Cephas, who Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve, and then he appears in his resurrected body to over 500 believers, 500 witnesses, and lastly, he appears to Paul. Okay, now note this, the disciples and most of those 500 witnesses died as martyrs. They died as martyrs, spreading the gospel. Are you willing to die spreading the gospel? Because somebody else's soul, eternal soul, depends on it. Are you willing to give your life? How's that? That sounds better. Are you willing to give your life to share the gospel, to become a part of a church that does that? Those 500 martyrs, most of them, including the disciples, died as martyrs for the gospel message. Now, as we look at all this, what do you need to hear? What do you need to know? Well, here's what you need to hear, and here's what you need to know. That Paul's confidence in our belief 
is rooted in his awareness that God's grace is a powerful force in our lives, in the life of a Christian. Paul believes that, and he's stating it. He's saying that God's grace is a powerful force in the life of a Christian. In you, in your life, instead of being an eyewitness like these others were that, that, that's spoken about in, in, this, in the passage, instead of being an eyewitness, your soul was quickened, was made alive, was awakened, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul is rejoicing at. It's, like, it's tremendous. The power of God's grace. The power of the Holy Spirit quickened you. It awakened you. So you would believe you would receive the gospel message. Here's what we must remember. We must remember in the glorious truth of the gospel that God created, God created humanity to have to enjoy and, and to God created humanity for, for enjoyment and fellowship with Him. God created us originally to have uh, enjoyment and eternal fellowship with Him. The fall destroyed that. The fall destroyed the fulfillment of this fellowship. God's promise in the resurrection of Jesus Christ to us is that he has and will restore our fellowship with him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is, is, just confirms it to us. It confirms that his fellowship with us has been restored, will be restored. And whatever the, the fall demolished will be restored. That is a, a tremendous thing to know that you're going to have, and you have even now starting, you have fellowship with the Almighty through Christ. That's what you stand on. That's what you believe. That's the gospel message. Especially during times like this. My little granddaughter, she's not here, so I'll talk about her, Macy. Now, Chris allowed me to tell this story, okay? The other day, broke down uncontrollably, uncontrollably. She, she didn't want to be pacified. She was broke down crying, sobbing, crying. What's wrong? It's like, it's like what's wrong? Yeah, what's wrong? What, what happened? You, are you hurt? You know, it's like it was just uncontrollable. She kept saying that she wanted to be two years old again. I want to be two years old. I want to be two years old again. Well, well what are you talking about? You want to be baby? I mean, what is it? As Chris starts consoling her, she comes out with why she wanted to be two again. She, want, she wanted to be two again so she wouldn't have to go back to school. So she didn't have to attend kindergarten, elementary, and face a madman. That's trying to kill her. That's looking at this incident through the eyes of a child. And those are the victims. Those are the victims. You can imagine her just thinking about it. just broke her down. Her hope, her only hope is in Jesus. The victims, their hope is in Christ. Their hope is in Christ. The 10 year olds that were murdered are at a point in their life where they're, 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 they're not accountable for, for even receiving Christ yet. They're with the Lord. We rejoice in that. How do we know that? How do we know that? How do we know that those kids are with Christ now? Do we know that they're all Christians? No, we don't. Well, what do we know? Well, we, we can reflect on, on, on Scripture for this. We go back all the way to the, the wilderness. And in the wilderness, the, remember the parents were grumbling against God. God, God had been taking care of them, a, a pillar, a, you know, a cloud of pillar, a pillar of fire and cloud and all that. 
feeding them all the time, giving them water from a rock. And they grumbled and kept grumbling. And then they told God, what about the children? What about the kids? What about our babies? You're just going to let them out die here in this desert. Don't you care? Oh, man. Don't say that to the Lord. Don't say that. They did. So what does God do? He says, I care. And they, every one of them, will enter the promised land except for you. You won't enter. They will. And everyone under, what, 20? Entered the promised land. Except for two adults. Everybody else died on the way. So that's how we know these children are with the Lord. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice in that. He is our salvation. He is our everything. Your belief in Christ must not be in vain. It must not be empty. It must not be hollow. Christ is calling for you. He's called you. He's called you time and time again. And you've answered. Some must have answered. And continue, but he still calls you to continue to walk in his ways and continue to be obedient to him. Continue to put him first and foremost. But others, they're still waiting and pondering. Many people that we know are like that, that we love. Answer the call. Answer his lovely call to come to him. Christ, God, is not the author of wickedness. But he will use, the Lord will use, such tragic events like your bounty to call you to him, to bring you to him. Come. Let's pray. Gracious.